Now, everyone, this is a real treat. We haven't had a meet the writer call in quite a while. And Scott is not only a writer, but he's like the darling of every narrator going. Um, he Because he becomes, he's our friend and he's in the group and he hangs, he's our peeps. So long story short, Scott also writes a blog and it's brilliant. It hours of entertainment, but you write the type of books I love as well. You've written some gorgeous thrillers. You work closely with your narrators. And I am interested, first, I want to get some of the juicy stuff about, Okay. were you born a writer? Did it take you years to get the guts to jump in? Did you end up, you know, sent somewhere else and doing a horrible corporate job like some of us? Or tell us your story, Scott. Um, I think the first time I ever thought about writing, I was probably seven or eight and i read harriet the spy which is you know about a young girl who wants to be a writer and that was the first time i mean i'd seen books so i know they had to be written but it was the first time i ever thought about doing it as a job you know but uh no i did not immediately jump into it i didn't really start writing seriously until i was in high school then, you know, college and the years after college, I basically took a decade off of doing anything positive. <laughs> and uh, I was working at a restaurant for most of that time. So no, no joy there. And then when I um, left, that was when I was in Potsdam, New York, which is where I went to college. And when I came back to the Syracuse area where I live now, um, it was just one garbage job after another my first one was at a lumber yard uh from there i went to a tractor trailer school and from there i went to a non-profit and each time it was a little more soul eating and the the non-profit job came to an end and i was just in a place where i could start devoting time to it how, and, how old were you at that point? Uh, to, 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 to about 49. So I, I have a theory from just my own casual theory from all the writers that I've met. Mm -hmm. The thing that it, it feels like they are born writers. Something imprints when they're young and they think, wow, this is an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And then because of society and life, the next thought is, well, it's a really hard job to get and only special people get it. And right. then they spend their whole lives trying to do what everyone else says they're supposed to do until they suddenly are like left with no options because they can't be anything but what they are, which it was a writer. Right. Yeah. I've actually written more than one blog post about that very thing. And I eventually came to the conclusion that being a writer is kind of like a pathology <laughs> you know, you, you have to do it. You just have to do it. If I don't write, if I don't write on something I'm working on every day, then after about two days of not writing, I start going crazy. You know, I've just got to get back to it. Something's going to have to get canceled so I can sit down and write for a while, you know, and, uh, you can't smother I, I think, that need, though. They try with kids. Parents try. Right. So they try keep you safe. I remember that it was the same with acting. I remember in my corporate job, like 10 years ago, going to an away day, and they thought they'd make me happy and make it a musical. Mm -hmm. And I literally left after like the first 30 minutes. I spent the rest of the time in the bathroom bawling my eyes out, <laughs> like from pure jealousy. And, right. you know, because it's like in your face. But you, but so how did you finally get the courage to write? How, after all those years of soul sucking nothingness? It, it was one of those things and, and, you know, goes along with that cliche question that writers always get asked, where do your ideas come from? Um, my theory is they come from a lot of different places and one of them is out of the blue. And in 2009, I got an out of the blue idea. I got like the first line of the book 
word for word and just sat down and started writing it. Um, over the uh, months of revision, that line ended up being like the third line in the book, but it's still a good line. But uh, What's the, the, line? the funny thing is, uh, wait, wait, any spoilers Sarah was, here? <laughs> Sarah was the chosen one. Like was that. was the original first line, um, and then I did. I think when I revised it, I wanted to set the visual scene a little more before I jumped into that. But anyway, I got to. But funny story is, I had it saved on an external hard drive that failed uh, after two chapters were written, and right then like literally within a day or two of that, my son uh, left for the Marines. So I wasn't really thinking about writing at that point. And uh, the next few years were kind of rough. They were, you know, I was out of work by then. I had the time to write, but I just couldn't get my head right. Yeah. And then in 2015, we moved from the house that we lived in since my daughter was in first grade, and she's going to be 29 this year. So we'd lived there quite a while, and we moved into a, a smaller apartment, you know, an empty nest type situation, and all of the sudden, everything clicked. Everything started working. Um, I got my laptop out. And I found a bag full of uh, thumb drives. And so I was plugging them in to see, you know, what was on there. One of them actually had the first two chapters of the book, which I thought was gone forever. And I'm like, hmm, oh, I remember that idea. So, so wait, I'm going to, can I stop you for one second? Because sure. this is brilliant. And this comes to, I don't, I don't know the person, but there was a conversation on Facebook and I was trying to, it's brilliant what you've just said, because they were having a really hard time and they went through the hard time and it was life, basically, mm -hmm. you know, family and this happened and that happened and they moved and this went wrong and that went wrong and they've got all these deadlines. And what they were feeling that they were failing at was the deadlines. I've got to mm -hmm. do these deadlines. It's, it's, you're so focused to do a good job and try really hard. But it's, it's like you, that's exactly what it is. You can do anything you want, can't you? You can beat yourself up and try really hard, but things have to be, they're kind of like, when it's time, it's right. time and every, it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, huh. it shouldn't. And I honestly think the change of environment had a lot to do with it for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, some people might think this is a little spacey, but I believe that houses have... Yes. Uh, you know, a spirit sort of. Yes. And that house didn't have a particularly good one. And, and even though we lived there a very long time, I didn't realize it towards maybe the last two or three years that I was really feeling it was time to go. And I hate moving. So if I'm thinking it's time to go, it's time to go. And they and soak up like, your bad memories as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And there were yeah. more than one or two. And so when we got here, like I said, it just, all of that was gone. And I found those first two chapters. When we first moved here and for, our, for probably almost the first year, we didn't have uh, cable or internet yet. So I used to go to the public library every day and use their Wi-Fi. And I wrote my first novel in the Baldwinsville Public Library. And Oddly enough, I just did a, a multi-author signing there this past weekend. I saw on the Saturday. pictures. <laughs> and, uh, so you're like J.K. Rowling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a slightly smaller wallet. But other than that, exactly. But my, mo my mother used to do that every fall. Um, she would paint our bedrooms a different mm -hmm. color. Because move the furniture around, paint the bedroom, fresh start, fresh right. year. you got to mark these things. And that... That library was your clean, fresh start. Exactly. Exactly. When did and you then, start thinking uh, of yourself as a writer? Like, when was the first time you thought, I'm it? I am a writer now. I'm not going back. <laughs> Probably be, right before um, I published that novel, I published a collection of short stories. And 
some of them were very old, like from my college years, some of them were brand new. And I've actually since then uh, revised it and added a couple more to it. But when I held that in my hand for the first time, that's when it felt real. And uh, yeah, I was, I was very happy to be alone when that first box of books came because I was ugly crying. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, do you do any, did you celebrate? Um, I didn't really, I, I intended to, uh, and I mean, mentally I did, but when the, when the novel came out, I actually did have a, a release day party with one or two friends at home. And so that was pretty cool. Got to share that with them. So I have a question. I've one of my favorite books, which I still haven't completely finished, um, is there are actually two, one about women and one about men male writers and female writers and the rituals have you have you heard of the book i can't remember the name no i haven't brilliant book about all the famous writers that we know and what their rituals were and one of Mm. them was great she had to have like four espressos and a pack of cigarettes and like chocolate and curl up in her bed to write and i just thought ooh, had you know so deck and i probably would die if i tried that (laughs) once but But I love that they had to have, and all the writers had these weird, like, I think, was it Stephen King? He sits down at the same exact time every single day. I might have the Mm -hmm. totally wrong Mm -hmm. writer. But do you have any rituals now or things that you might not even realize it? I I do. I I do a thing I call pre-gaming before I sit down to write every day. And that usually consists of one or two practical things. Like if there's any emails I absolutely have to take care of, get those out of the way. Um, I usually journal a little bit about what I'm intending to write so that if like all the brain cells shut down at once, I can just look at the journal and go, oh yeah, that's what I was going to do. So you set your intentions. uh, I like that. And I also usually write how I'm feeling about what I'm going to work on that day. This part might be tough. This part's going to be fun. This part's a, you know, a breeze, whatever. Then uh, usually talk to Craig for a minute because I like to let him know when I'm writing. So he doesn't bother me. <laughs> no, I'm just, you kidding. guys are like best but friends, aren't you? We kind of are. And, I and I'll that. tell that story when I finish telling the ritual story, but uh <sighs> it takes me about an hour of just doing those sort of things. And sometimes it's environmental, like my desk, you guys thankfully can't see right now. Um, but, uh, I'm not supposed to interrupt you, but um, Craig says that just makes me bother him more. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> but uh, once, you know, I, I don't even, can't even tell you what it is that finally makes me feel like, okay, I'm ready. But eventually I hit that point and I can usually jump right in. I don't start slow. I don't lose my thread. I just jump in right on a good day. I can get 2,500 words on a great day. I can get 4,000. I love that. Um, So that's like when you make soup and you know, the stuff goes on the top. Right. So before you go to write, you skim the top off. Exactly. I love that. Get get all that out of the way. And then I shut off all my sound and everything because I have a laptop and a desktop that I work on. The laptop's a lot faster uh, internet wise. So if I need to look something up, I usually do it on there. But I do, I shut off all the speakers and just try and blaze through. Same time every day, different time. um, Same time-ish every day. Usually um, I come into the office about noon because I'm, you know, so ambitious. And uh, (laughs) then it's usually, like I said, about an hour, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. So the the ritual starts about the same time every day, but the writing varies a little bit. And do you, do you take a day off? Like, do you have boundaries, like scheduled days off, or do you just kind of go with the flow and what you're feeling? I, I kind of go with the flow because there's a lot of days when I'd like to write that I'm not able to. So every now and then on like a weekend or something like that, I'll, you know, take some time to write, but there's been a lot of fun stuff going on lately. I, I uh, had a granddaughter 
born our very first congratulations i saw the pictures and, beautiful yeah, she actually just turned one month old yesterday so we've been spending a lot of time hanging out with her she's pretty cool she uh already knows i'm cool because every time they hand her to me she smiles and i refuse to believe <laughs> it's gas mutual but, uh, joy yeah so so what I, I i guess i'm saying is i try and be consistent but flexible so sometimes the weekends are work days sometimes you know i'll take a day off and on wednesday or thursday or and i think when my kids have to go back to work uh in december i'm going to be watching her every friday so i have to get like one of those good front loader baby bundles so that i can type and she'll just <laughs> stare at the screen for me and maybe proofread i don't know because you know she's going to be brilliant so do you write the same kind of books that you read yes because i read every kind of book there is ah. and so that's why i have a fantasy series and a thriller series and an espionage series and a literary love story standalone because everything that i like to read i like to write now you so. first when you first had your books turned into audiobooks mm -hmm. was it jarring hearing <laughs> Because I hear that it's an interesting experience because you know these characters, you love them, you hate them, they're your family, and then all of a sudden they've got a different voice. You know, I right. mean, if you're very lucky, the same voice, but they're right. going to be so. I think it's like listening to your own voice if you've never listened to your own voice recorded. Right. Everyone right. thinks, oh my God, I don't sound like that. I don't so, sound like that. Right. Yeah. So isn't that the same listening to your writing in audio first, the first a time? A little bit. And the reason I laughed as you you asked me if it was jarring and the first book that i had uh, done in audio is called jelly jars so <laughs> that that's you know the sort of stuff that makes was that with laugh. Avon? was that yes. with Avon? oh well yes you're and that again. was my introduction to you know my stuff my own solo stuff being um turned into audio because craig and i had written an espionage series and i think all of those were recorded I honestly have never listened to any of them um, because that series for us was kind of like where we learned to write together, but neither of us are like particularly proud, <laughs> proud of it. Wait, didn't Austin, didn't Austin do one of those? That's a different series. That's, that's my series, the cleanup crew. Um, because I was going to say, yes. even if that book was written by a four-year-old, if you had Austin do it, it's going to be amazing. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, like I said, Avon and I worked together on my first book that I actually, you know, had done. And it, it was probably an atypical experience for a lot of narrators because she wanted me there listening as often as I possibly could with Austin, it was just the opposite. She didn't say, you know, stay the hell out, but she said, you know, she did. We did the first 15. She said, are you happy with everything? <laughs> I was. And then, you know, two, three weeks later, I was proofing this amazing book. And she, the thing Austin did that I love, and I don't know if I ever even told her this, but the the lead character in that series is a woman named nicole porter who her actual name is is uh jennifer june uh and she's changed everything because she became an assassin after a very rough upbringing and the thing in my mind that i don't think i ever wrote or talk to anyone about is that Nicole is unintentionally very, very sexy. Like she's the kind of woman that just says, you know, I'm going to the store for eggs and you melt, you know, <laughs> and Austin got that. Yeah. She, she nailed it. You know, from the very first time Nicole speaks, you hear that bubbling, you know, down under in her. And it, it was amazing. So even without any input from me, she got everything right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, full I, disclosure, I'm biased because like, <laughs> I'm a total fangirl of both Austin and Avon. So, I can't, right. <laughs> you know, well, you're not going to hear a bad word from me, but they were, I, they're pretty terrific. 
yeah, I couldn't have started out with a better two people. And uh, so uh, the beauty of Bucharest was the most recent one. And then uh, Avon and I ended up doing the fantasy series, all three books. And that was actually her idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were talking one day about one of the themes that I used in the book. And uh, she asked me a couple of questions and then all of a sudden, you know, we were, uh, I think she was recording or had finished recording because I seem to remember hearing her say these words, I have to record this. Okay, and we got to stop because I've just realized something. We should save this till the bit when Avon's on. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I don't. I wasn't going to get into a lot of detail about yeah, it. Yeah, because but... I'm afraid we're going to waste the good stuff without her. <laughs> without her. So you guys, we're going to, full disclosure, we're having a celebrity guest and Avon's going to pop in for the last 15 minutes. And we're going to, we're going to kind of try to like, maybe garner what a little bit of the magic formula that Avon and, um, and our super guest here have, um, working together and how much of a kind of like writer, narrator camaraderie can make such a difference in working. But before we do that, I want to hear all the juicy stuff you've got on Craig. Craig Hart is a horrible human being. <laughs> um, the fact that he's still free indicates when did you guys how far meet each other our society again? has fallen. What? And when did you guys meet each other again? How did we, this all? We actually met on Twitter in 2011. And the only reason I remember it is I scrolled all the way back to then in my Twitter feed to find the first time we talked. But Craig was on Twitter and he was sort of tweeting a, a story. And I think it was based on the whole Schwarzenegger nanny thing that had happened right about then. So <laughs> that sounds like something Craig would tweet. <laughs> exactly. So I instantly connected with that humor. And so I started uh, direct messaging him saying, why don't you say this next? Or, you know, maybe you should have him do this. And he, st I started watching as the words that I had just given him were appearing, you know. And a writing and, uh, team was born. After that, he was like, I I'm on Facebook. I have a blog. And I'm like, okay, I'll check those out. And it just, the friendship grew. We didn't actually start writing together for six years after that. But I don't think we were ever not in contact almost daily ever just because we had found someone as insane as we were. So I like that's that. a good thing I to like find. Kindred spirits. I like yeah. that. It's good to have friends though. It really is. It's good to have like buddies. It's good to have someone, don't you think, that you don't have to kind of make any effort to be good yes. around. Yes. Do you know what it's I mean? It's essential. It's absolutely essential. Craig's life. And uh, we definitely... <laughs> are hoping no one ever hacks our uh, Facebook messenger thread because we'll probably both become pariahs if that ever gets <laughs> Or <on>. arrested. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so tell me a little bit about not working with a narrator because I'd, I'd like to use, when we have Avon, I'd like to concentrate on that. But from a writer's perspective, what would you love a narrator to know about what you need from us? And what would you love them to know about what you don't need from us? What would you say? The, the first thing I would probably do because it, it's more important to me in my writing now is talk about some of the themes rather than the exact, you know, storyline itself, because that will run all the way through and it will influence, you know, how the characters are going to react in certain situations and so forth. So I, I just would like them to, to clearly know what it is I'm trying to pull, I guess yeah. would be a good way of putting it. And, uh, and then the next thing I would this is actually both of those of uh, what I would do and what I wouldn't do is assure them that I trust them completely at this point. I've told you all I can tell you about it. It's in your hands. And 
I'm good with whatever you bring to me, unless it's horrible, which so far it's been phenomenal because I've had two great narrators, but it's at that point, it's the narrator's baby until it comes back to me. Unless like with Aves, we work together during the recording and then it's, it's a little bit different, but yeah, I think at this point, what I would want them to know is what I'm trying to achieve and then use that to interpret how they approach the characters more than and i would of course you know say well this guy's got this sort of accent i like to always make sure i give you a good character sheet and everything and uh, i'm surprised avon's not rolling her eyes when i talk about accents because i've been cruel to her that's all there is to it. <laughs> but, uh, one of those writers that thinks it's fun to just pop well, someone from every part of the world <laughs> in my defense and the everything guy came into the that's been shop recorded and he had the Ethiopian accent next to the French <laughs> one next to the Swedish one. <laughs> uh, it, it was almost that bad. But anyway, in my defense, when everything that we've recorded, I wrote prior to ever thinking about doing audiobooks. So it, it was uh, it was actually part of my education too with that first book. Uh, book that I did with Avon, realizing that I need to take that into account when I'm writing now, because now I'm writing thinking, I'm already thinking which narrator I'm going to ask to, to do it, you know, three, four pages in. So I do try and catch myself, but I mean, writers are horrible creatures of habit, and there's probably things I do unintentionally that make you guys go you know. i heard from a reliable source that scott wrote his first book before audio was even invented no one even That's had right. ears at that point yes exactly <laughs> true in fact my uh, original papyrus uh, first draft is now in the national archives so <laughs> okay no but the thing is have you had listener feedback regarding your audiobooks or your books? Do you have a relationship with your readers? Are you, or are you somebody that kind of would rather be sequestered and do the work and live with the characters? And I, I, I love having contact with readers. Um, I've made, you know, this is, this is something actually that Mark Dox, Dawson talks about. There's a transition between reader to fan to friend and you know i mean obviously that's not going to happen with everyone but there's some people who i consider good friends now who started out as readers and that that feedback for one thing i have one uh fan in in england who's like insane and <laughs> she every time she doesn't think i'm writing fast enough she'll post a dominatrix gif whipping me you know <laughs> Get working, get working. And, but that's cool because it's motivating, you know? I mean, not actually being whipped, but knowing someone <laughs> is thinking like that, you know? So that's kind of cool. And I've actually every now and then gotten an idea from someone who's, who's read something before. And I always write everything down when someone, you know, says, Hey, do you ever think about this? I don't always do anything with it, but you just never know. And so why not, why not be connected to your readers and your listeners? Do you ever put anyone in your books that piss you off in real life? And <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the title story to the short story collection um, is 99% ripped from the headlines, okay? It, it all actually happened. The one part that I created was there was a little bit of a mystical element at one point, but everything else was pretty much word for word, line for line from uh, a period. Well, the, when I was talking about working in the restaurant um, in Potsdam, it, it's, it's based on there. And the owner of that restaurant and I, did not see eye to eye by the mm. end of our time together. And so he is not treated very uh, compassionately in that story. Um, I would learn, and, I would uh, write just because of a few people I'd like to. 
<laughs> include. I um actually uh, have a formed a friendship and Craig and I both have because she was a guest on, on our show with uh, Angelique Lamour, Louis Lamour's daughter. Wow. And I recently bought her a coffee cup, which I have to find and mail because I think <laughs> I told her two months ago that I got it for, her. but it says something along the lines of, you know, don't put piss off the writer. She'll put you in a story and do you yeah. in, you know, what about so dark nights nice of the soul, Scott? <laughs> what about what about did you ever have moments where you thought were you I, I saw a movie I, and it just impressed me so much but I remember the girl couldn't write she just couldn't come up with anything to write and so she made herself wake up every day at like mm. 7 a.m and she stood there or sat there she didn't have anything right. to write but she sat there every single day at 7 a.m for like an hour and watched the clock tick by yeah. And, and had nothing until finally like i think her life changed and she finally wrote like at the end of the movie obviously but good because it would have been a horrible movie exactly like but it struck me like what would i do if i had writer's block would i would i have that strength of will do i mean i find it hard enough going in and you know i don't want to get the wrong impression because it's the thing i'm the most proud of that right. life can throw you and you can still go in and and do a great job so i do do it but it it's it's a mindset challenge mm -hmm. what about you with writing i can only imagine staring at a blank page if life is throwing you curveballs yeah i i don't ever feel like i've had writer's block but i've had depression so that pretty much covers everything you know don't want to get out of bed don't want to get in the shower don't want to eat don't want to see the sunrise and you know when when it's rough like that which thank god it hasn't really been lately uh, i can't write i can't do anything yeah but when it's not like that even some days it feels more like work than other days um you know, there are days when I sit down at the keyboard and I type and I look up at the clock and it's five hours later and I've written 30 pages, you know, and there's just absolutely no interruption to the flow at all. And then there's times where two sentences and then I have to stop and work through where I want to go or do I want to go with those, you know, and that's people, always... people don't tell you that, do they? All the memes no, on no, Facebook, that's not they the all job say, if you love it, the money will flow and you'll, <laughs> you know, if you love it, you still won't love it all the time. No, it's impossible. <laughs> and, and for me, it always seems this, the scenes or chapters that I struggle with are the ones that end up being pivotal to the story. Um, you know, without revealing too much in the second book of the uh, Cleanup Crew series, which I believe will be in production towards the end of the year or early next year, uh, we get Nicole's backstory and it's horrible. And <laughs> it literally took me 13 days to write 10 pages because it was so disturbing to me the stuff I was writing was disturbing me, you know, but it explained everything that had happened up to that point and set the tone for everything that would happen in the next two, well, three books. And it was essential. I hated it. I hate, it. I don't even like reading it. And I actually had a a review on Amazon where someone called me out on it and said I should have, you know, put a warning on the cover or something like that. But honestly, I think I find a way to offend someone in everything I write. I so. love those are my favorite kind of books. My favorite review I ever got is somebody gave me like five stars, me and the writer, or they get like all and they said, they said, I love this book so much. I threw up within the first five minutes. It was horrifying. <laughs> and it was the best review ever. I'm so proud. I would like frame it because really? some bo books are not always supposed to be pretty no. and make you happy. They're supposed no. to make you feel. So you've done your job. Yeah, exactly. If you upset fact, people, that's, you know, we're grown ups. 
If you see right. a word or two you don't like, close the book or exactly. don't listen. Exactly. Um, a lot of the reviews of the cleanup crew books complain about the language, but I'm dealing with human traffickers. Okay. They don't sit around and say a uh, cup of tea, you know, but what is the like, subject? I'm sure there's a blurb on Amazon. What does the blurb say the book is about? The second book or, or a any the, of them, the ones that human traffickers, does the blurb mm -hmm. say, I don't think it the, specifically says that's the crime that she's, she's, there to stop but it talks about despicable men doing despicable things right there's a crime it doesn't have a yeah. naked guy on the cover and no. flowers and rose petals <laughs> so you know what i mean they know what they're buying no i, I don't have any patience for that right. even even my love story doesn't have a naked guy on the cover so. right you know the ones i'm talking about there's yeah, nothing wrong sure with do. the shirtless covers Nothing wrong with them. I t all right. respect for them. But you know what you're buying when you get them. And you know yeah, what absolutely. you're buying when you get a thriller. And, you know, I, yeah. I just don't have a lot of. Yeah, I, I agree. And, I, and I've, <laughs> I think Craig and I talked about it on one of our podcasts on the whole, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember the term there. Sensitivity reader thing. Where you would, you know, include in your advanced readers people who are looking just for stuff that's going to offend people. I don't need one of those because it all does. So <laughs> I don't, you know, it's just. I guess the fairest thing to do would stamp every cover with "Don't read this at all." And you I don't know. know I, I gonna, just think it's like going to a burlesque show and getting offended if someone takes their clothes off. Right? <laughs> You know, I yeah. mean, you know where you are, you know, pick your venue. It's, it's, I mean, that's my opinion. And, and, and the one last point I would make about that backstory was I was very careful not to make it in any way seem like I thought this was a titillating story. I, presented it, as, I presented it as a horrible thing that happened to a wonderful person because of her horrible father, you know, and it's also something I, you know, I've had to deal with personally, um, you know, uh, abuse situations when I was very young. And so it's not like I was just like writing a cool story. I was remembering some of my own pain. And I think it makes, like I said, I think it makes everything before and after that point make much more sense. So but do you not I'm think that's hard? It. I mean, that's, to me, the point of art. Writers, writers more so than narrators, but narrators and actors as well, we deal in the murky waters of trauma, emotion, mm -hmm. hatred, violence, um, sex. We deal in the areas that other people don't normally want to be faced with in real life. We do it for them. Right. Right. We're brave enough to face it every day, especially writers. You're, you're bringing that out of your own brain and your own emotions. You're living it viscerally for yeah. them. And, and so other people don't have to from the safety of their sofa. Right. They can experience and what we need to experience. Ultimately, like you said, if it's too much, close the book. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about books is they have covers, you know. But that's also hard on someone that fights depression, that mm -hmm. fights because you are bravely putting yourself at the front of those hardcore feelings every single day. A normal person, a normal person, a non, a non artist or writer or narrator, a person that goes to like a job and doesn't want to delve right. into the creative side of the brain too much can protect themselves a little bit more but mm -hmm. you're not protecting yourself at all. You're going full force into all the emotions every single exactly. day as your job. You wouldn't be a human being if you didn't get depressed right. occasionally. And the strength it must take to then pull yourself up from that and write like you do is amazing. I mean, that's like the writers. Those are the artists. 
that we talk about, not that we want you to die, obviously, but that we talk about long after. Did you see what I'm saying? You're leaving yeah. something with the world that, 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 that most people aren't brave enough to do. And that's amazing. I think it's amazing. Nice, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. I think it's amazing. I wish I could, I can do it acting through other people's words, but mm -hmm. that's hardcore mining mm -hmm. your own experiences and having the guts to put it out there. Yeah. There, there's something on the horizon. I've actually been threatening for a couple of years. Um, I have decided to release a volume of my poetry and I've decided to narrate it myself because poetry is a little different uh, from fiction in that the, the poet has very, very clear ideas about how, how every single line has to sound. Yeah. And as much as I've learned to trust my narrators and as much as they mean to me, I just know they're not going to be able to do it the way I'm going to be able to do it. Because it's always going to be the narrator's interpretation. No matter right. what you do, it has to be, or it would sound fake. And, and I mean, there, you want there's it to be not you. necessarily anything wrong with that. No. If, you know, I mean, if I didn't have any, you know, uh, dramatic background or anything, I probably would be a lot more reluctant to record my own poetry and I would be happy to just go with what the narrator interpreted as because with poetry, you kind of, every reader is going to read something a little different anyway, but it is, it's so, but if you can do it, do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've always been enough of a ham, you know, I did, <laughs> I did act through college um, never anything more than that, except I was in, my kids were in a production of Joseph when they were, I don't know, <laughs> 13 and 11 or something like that. And I played Jacob because they needed a guy with gray hair and a beard. So, <laughs> but, uh, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. It's all areas. Then you've, you've yeah. touched all areas. I think it's wonderful. Uh, it's okay. So shall we bring the lovely Avon on? Well, that would be wonderful. Avon Shore, where are you? Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. I want to oh. hear about you and Scott working together. I'm going to kind of back up and let you guys riff for a few minutes because a lot of narrators find it quite intimidating dealing with their writers. And I mean, I wouldn't do, to be honest, I, I would be more of an Austin because, you know, me and mm -hmm. Discord and everything, I, I get too worried about the relationship with the writer whereas then I want to lose myself but I'm very intrigued about the back and forth the respecting the boundaries the developing the relationship and all that so go ahead guys have a quick chat and I will back up and try to shut up mostly hi Scott <laughs> hi Aves. hi um so I was cast for jelly jars I really wanted it because um, Craig posted the audition for Northern Like Audiobooks. And um, when I read it, when I read the audition, um, I fell in love with the, I, I fell in love with the main male character in a way that I never have reading a romance. Um, I recognized a, a wonderful old boyfriend in him. And I was like, I want this. An and actual kind of, old boyfriend? Yeah, yeah. It, it just in the first scene, it didn't hold throughout the book, but there was this emotional recognition of somebody I liked, right? In a, in a character that Scott had written. So I wanted it, but everybody auditioned for Jelly Jars and I didn't expect it, but I was cast in it. And Scott and I didn't know each other at all. Like that's where we met was because I was narrating on Discord and... I was already comfortable with narrating with an audience and with authors present. Um, so, yeah. And so. I loved it from day one because of what you said before, Dee, that hearing your words out of someone else's mouth, it's exciting it's, you know, a little intimidating at first, although I, I feel like we got past that pretty quick, but 
I mean, I've said this to her before, and she always gets mad at me, but I am one of Avon's biggest fans. And if she had never done any of my books and I heard her do something, that would still be the case. So for me to be there and listening to someone read that story, I felt like I was being honored a little bit, you know, and I, I can back, can I back Scott up? Avon doesn't know this, but the way Avon ended up on this call was Scott contacted me and said, can I please post on Cup of Joe how brilliant Avon is? And I was like, um, it's a group of 600 narrators. I might get in trouble if I let one be promote. How about, <laughs> but the thing is, it's so special and it's so wonderful when you finish a book and the writer is that happy with you. Mm -hmm. But not before we finished throughout. Um, yeah. And at some point, um, I, I mean, it definitely is important. Scott said that he surrenders total, <clears throat> total control um, to, the, to the narrator's choices and judgment. Oh, my voice is cracking. Um, but... I, I let him know that he was welcome to have input. And likewise, that gives me um, the ability to have input. And then we ended up talking more um, for a while after Jelly Jars. And um, th that, that ability to give each other feedback, um, we can't, oh no, I'm gonna lose. I'm going to lose my power here in a second. I'm um, sorry. Talk quick. Ahead, Talk really Scott. <laughs> no. Scott? Yes. We um, lost you. I think I cut you off last time. I'm sorry. I was so excited to jump in. <laughs> okay. uh, we lost Avon. Yep. She might be back. So, um, working with your narrator. Yeah. And <laughs> it was... Every single day, it was great. There was never a day where that felt like work to me. Even though, even in that first one, we ended up doing some things together that, that deviated from the printed text. Uh, a lot less in that one. Um, she, she stayed very true to the text. But every now and then, there was a phrase that, you know, didn't, didn't come across very well audibly. So we would just alter it a little bit to make it sound better. And every suggestion she made improved it without, without fail, every single one. Um, I think the only time in, in any of the four books that we've done together now that something she suggested didn't end up happening, it was because we both agreed later you know what, that didn't work as well as we thought it would. So let's do it this way instead. And, you know, we've been able to do that right pretty much from the start. I think by the third day of recording Jelly Jars, you know, she was comfortable enough to start asking me about, you know, can we possibly change this, possibly change that. And once or twice, there was a specific sound I wanted the character to make or something like that, like a, a spoken word, but a, a word spoken a certain way. And I would, you know, suggest that to her. And, you know, she very graciously would try it. Usually we ended up keeping it. Sometime I would say, no, that's dunk. Let's go with your idea, you know, and. But then how much different. of a difference you said you were happy with the different style of working that Austin had. Mm -hmm. And I'm not putting people's names on it because. I'm more of an Austin than an Avon, right. whereas I, I like to disappear into the book on my own. But mm -hmm. so how much of a difference did that make with you being able to give that input to Avon, but only getting the finished product? Um, again, it, w it was okay because I was prepared for it to be that way with Avon going in. You know, I was pretty much prepared. Uh, as she said, there were a ton of auditions for that one. And Craig will agree with me because he uh, had to go through them all too. And, and what did you, what did you hear in that audition that made you in love that Avon, audition? She was Peggy. She was Peggy, the, the main character of the book, the, the narrator, the, the girl who's 
life uh, changes are basically the story of the book. And she was her. She, the first time she spoke a line of Peggy's dialogue, I was like, there's Peggy. There's my narrator. It. There was just yeah. no question in my mind. And do you know what's so great about that? Because doesn't that, unless you, I hope you guys are all thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Every time you do an audition, no, it wasn't personal. You either sounded like the character the person was looking for, or you didn't. Right. And so literally, the more auditions you do, the more chance you have of hitting the characters you sound like. It's a numbers game at that point. You know, you do the best job you can, but it is a numbers game. If they don't hear you, they don't know if you sound like the character and it's not, or, or if you sound like their ex-wife that they hated and don't want to work with. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It's never personal. People right. forget that it's hard because we're putting ourselves on the line with this stuff too. So I think that's a really good point. You just know, sometimes you just know the character when you hear them. And, and I think... Peggy's back. I think... <laughs> there's Peggy. I think Ave said that it was a pretty easy book for you, right? Because it was so in line with your natural cadence and, and stuff like that. It's one of the hardest books I've done, Scott. <laughs> there's like 17 accents. <laughs> I yeah, there was like yeah. the, some of the worst emotion. He uh, he was being sarcastic. I'm just cluing in now. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm like bawling my eyes out. Yeah, were there a lot of accents? Like what accents? There were a lot of accents. There truly were. Yeah. So. Like which yeah. accents? Which uh, accents? Middle Eastern, Texas. <laughs> what else Hispanic. did we have? British. Yep. yep. Um, and Elvis yeah. Elvis yeah. yeah she actually had to do an Elvis impersonator so what's your Elvis like Kevin uh, <laughs> I profusely apologize <laughs> <laughs> he's been forgiven as long as he keeps keeps the narrator under consideration in the future. <laughs> yes. I love that you've trained him well you've trained mm -hmm. him well well, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it it benefits me to learn. I, I've used this phrase when I've been listening to Avon. It's okay. That's how I learn. <laughs> because <laughs> some, sometimes she'll just be like, don't say that. <laughs> you know? I actually, and, uh, like, I actually like that phrase, though, in response to feedback. I quite like that. Well, I think we could I all mean, use that more. It, I was trying to be a smart ass at the time, but it was also true, you know? Yeah. Um, for us to be able to work together, I have to know that when, when she invites me, because when I'm with her, I'm on her turf, I'm in her booth, you know, and she's the boss. So I have to figure out the things when she's struggling that she doesn't like to hear. I have to, you know, find more novel ways to encourage her sometimes. And, and, do you think that Every came from knowing Craig, though? You had the inside scoop before you even started. A, a little bit. Craig and I, I mean, we, we talked about audio a lot, and I knew that, you know, he had done it, and I heard some of his work, but we didn't really talk about that aspect of it, about an author, you know, being involved or not involved in the production. So To me, working so well with the writer. No help at all. To, but to me, working, <laughs> Greg, <laughs> to me, working well with a writer, though, do you not agree, Avon, is like one of the most rewarding parts of the job? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And you're, you're making both products better, I think. Yeah. Um, what, you know, I'll, I'll point out the typos along the way, because he's right there. Right. You know, you can just fix it in the ebook. You know, there's no email to write later that, you know, oh, here's your typo list. Um, you know, and it went from there because live, I can read a sentence and I'll be like, mm, I think you mean this word instead? He's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> or, or um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have an untoward opinion of something. 
and he'll be like, yeah, well, I wrote this however many years ago. I would really prefer to like change the tone of that. Can you just change that sentence? Can you just elide that sentence? Um, and we can just do that, you know, because yeah. it's, because it's live. And we yeah, did that I mean, a lot. that's special. I don't have this relationship with all authors that to, yeah. to be unafraid to, to make comments on, on the content. Gosh, and you, we never do that. That's, <laughs> that's an yeah, alphabet. Do, do you not find that magic yeah. though? Do you not yeah. find yourself trying to get more of that, even with writers that you're not going to have that give and take from? I find myself wanting more of that before the sample because it makes such a difference in the way you feel narrating the book when you know that there's that easy camaraderie, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't get it though. Sometimes it's just not, you know, it's just professional, it's work. But and, and there's a place for that as well, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how it was with Austin, although we've also developed a friendship um, and I think during production, maybe twice she had a question, you know, and she came to me with that and I answered it for her. And then when I heard the finished product, realizing how she took that answer and ran with it, you know, um, in my opinion, that's very rewarding, you know, to, to be mm -hmm. able to have a narrator that you can trust that to that degree. But the, the, the way Ava and I work together, it's just amazing it's it makes every time we sit down together fun because we know we're improving this as we're going i love Which that and she's almost she's a pro. nothing in jelly jars almost nothing like five words maybe yep. in jelly jars along the way but um we just finished his fantasy series which is a much earlier book that he's written a three book trilogy and that felt a lot more collaborative because yeah. It was a long time ago, right, Scott? Right, and there were right. things that yeah, wanted I, to change. So it was kind of like a live edit in some ways. Yeah. But that's your wheelhouse because you've done a lot of, have you not done a lot of like fantasy or game literary? I listened to one book of yours that was like a game litty fantasy thing. It was really good. Oh, I, I want as much of it as I can get, which is yeah. why as soon as he, I, I said, what? You wrote a fantasy series? It's Give occurred to me. It's occurred to me that you've done a job on me. Now I'm going to have to really edit. I really hope I haven't called Avon Austin or Austin Avon interchangeable. No, no, I think you call. nailed it every time. I know. I only work with A narrators. So A list. <laughs> a well, that's the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, guys, I'm going to put Scott in the spotlight here. We're putting this in one of those time locks, you know, the ones they do in school where everyone buries something that they want dug up in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And in 60, 70, 80 years, the YouTube audience is going to listen to this call. And what would you like to final words of wisdom, um, an off color joke? What would you like them to be to find when they unearth this in 60, 70 years? <sighs> I guess what I would want them to know is that uh, at least one person on this planet was able to find the thing that they loved the most and did it for the rest of their life. Wow. Wow. wow and if one right. person can do it, we, we can, can all do, do it. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I say you and Linda Mooney, you're, you're literally narrator whisperers. So <laughs> thank you very much. And for, every, for writing the beautiful words that enable us to do our job, for, for treating our, our, our stars so well, and for looking out for us all, and for being our friend. Well, because... that's, that's the joy of it for me, is I've made so many great friends. And you know, if I never write another book, that'll be a win for me of course they'll probably stop hanging out with me if i stop writing books no we'll be the first <laughs> ones to buy your poetry book and listen to you narrating <laughs> okay thank you so much i really really appreciate you taking your time to chat with us scott and thank you for joining us avon scott was so proud of you and and it was lovely and it's lovely to see the camaraderie and the kind of like magical spark that created that audiobook for jelly jars and 
It's just wonderful. Fabulous, fabulous writer. And we are honored to have you in Cup of Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Avon, And thanks, guests. And thanks, Craig and Jonathan and Kat and Grace. And I'm going to miss people. So I'm going to just shut up now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, you guys. Two weeks, the video will be out. Don't do anything we wouldn't do. Bye, everyone. <laughs>